Welcome, welcome, welcome. How's everybody doing? Hope you are doing well. My name is Andrew Kuhn with Focus Compounding, on air live with Jeff Gannon. Jeff, how's it going today? It's going very well, Andrew. How's it going with you? It's going great. We hope it's going great with everybody else as well. If this is the first time you're tuning in with us, thank you so much for joining us. Be sure to check out all of our content that we push out into the investing universe. Of course, the best way to do that is to follow me on X, formerly known as Twitter, at at Focus Compound. All the information is in the description below. Wherever you are listening or watching us here today, be sure to hit the subscribe button so you'll be notified every time we upload a podcast. So in today's podcast, we are going to continue on with our Dear Chairman uh, series, and we're going to start at Chapter 2. Uh, which is about Robert Young. We are in the year 1954. Uh, we have some notes on it, obviously, going to talk about it. There's a lot in this chapter, I will say. I thought it was a pretty dense chapter, and I was thinking, okay, how are we going to keep the timeline going and, and make a, a good podcast out of it within you know 20 to 30 minutes? Um, but definitely an interesting guy, Jeff. And for people that are watching right now on the screen, uh, mm -hmm. before we recorded, Jeff started talking. I'm like, hold on, let me let me start the podcast so we could do this in real time. He was showing me his book uh, that he has called Robert R. Young, The Populist of Wall Street. And you could buy this, as you could see, it's available. It's easier to get than some of the other books that we talk about on the podcast. Yep. Uh, you could buy it for $19. Jeff had actually, yes. I'm gonna pull it up right here. I got a new prized possession is this book, Les Schwab, Pride in Performance, Keep It Going. Um, it's a book that seemed impossible to find. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. But Jeff had a, I don't know, did you buy this or did you uh, find I a copy or what? I had a copy um, from a while ago. Yeah. yeah. So you don't know Secret, right? So I love buying used books. I have mm -hmm. said the reason I like buying used books is because it's fun to see what other people underline if they put any notes in the margins or in the uh you know covers or whatever so i open up on this first page i'm not gonna name any names mm -hmm. uh we'll say his name is it's addressed to jeff we'll say jeff we'll say okay. it's jeff with a j though not with a g okay welcome to the blank team we look forward to working with you this book shares a little of our basic philosophy and work ethic apply these ideas to us plus I won't say, we'll say cars. We'll say whatever industry. We'll say apply this to us plus cars. I think you'll fit in well here. Good luck. Best regards from, we'll say Dennis. Uh, yeah. Pretty cool, right? Like, honestly. I, not I should... unusual with used books. No, With used not at business all. books. So like what you're yeah. describing there, they give these out to salespeople when they join whatever team because the Les Schwab book is a lot about selling. And so they'll give it to them. Whether that person read it or not, who knows? I don't remember there being much underlining in the actual book or anything. There's not much there evidence that someone read the book. But they were yeah. given it, yeah. Some of the entertainment ones I have are signed by some people um, that are odd ones. So, like, one is the – I have a book from someone uh, who was the president of ABC, and it's signed to an actress who was on a, a sitcom on ABC. So Really? Wow, yeah. look at that. Yeah. So yeah. – Probably. I mean, they uh -huh. didn't sell it as saying that it was uh, collectible <laughs> or anything. So I don't know why they would fake that, but yeah. they could have. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's the most likely thing because a lot of these things didn't sell a ton and uh, they were used for purposes like that. Yeah. So yeah. Th those business books you see a lot for being given out by companies to people. Yeah. I love it. I mean, I love it though. I think it's, I mean, the best thing you can do, honestly, to help people out is give them uh, a book that you think fits within everything that you do, right? Give somebody the outsider's book, give them dear chairman, give them whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it's good to do that. So I don't know. I was super excited to uh, see that in the cover and I can't wait to read the book. So Robert Young, teach a, or tell us a little bit about Robert Young. You have uh, the book that the a book, lot of yes. this chapter was sourced from. Um, right. But yeah, so, we could talk very high level about who he was, why he's important and why we're going to talk about right. him on this uh, podcast. So we should start with some of that stuff things that might not be in the chapter as much and touched on the chapter, but so we get them out of the way. So um, Dear Chairman, 
by Jeff Graham. This is chapter two, and that's what we're going to be doing. And that's what most people would probably like to read. You really do not need to read The Populist of Wall Street. It is a much longer book. It is all about the proxy fights that he had, but he had several proxy fights, whereas this chapter focuses really on one. And um, it doesn't really add that much to it other than that. So if you're worried about the complexity of it and getting that into a 30-minute podcast, there's a lot more of the legal complexity and stuff in the book. The other issue with the book is, as you can see, the um, Populist of Wall Street book, unlike Jeff Graham's book, was published um, in the 60s. And so it knew about the eventual merger between the railroad we'll be talking about here, the New York Central, um, into a company that would become um, uh, it would become Penn Central, um, so uh, which would go bankrupt a few years later. So that part of the story is not told there. So like that, the book that um, the Populist of Wall Street ends with is like how the stock was doing and everything after that merger, and you'd be up a little bit and whatever. But it doesn't know that in a few years that's going to be one of the biggest bankruptcies in U.S. history, right? So. Um, the other thing we should mention here is that the person we're talking about, Robert Young, which this addresses at the end of the chapter, uh, he commits suicide shortly after sad. the events. I was of the not. Book. Yeah. I was like, wow. Yeah, I was yeah. uh, kind of sad to. Yeah, I mean, I was just like, damn, I was not expecting that. Just from personality, I guess, just from reading, I was just very shocked to see that. Yeah. Yeah. Which both in Jeff Graham's book and in um, anything else that I've read, that wasn't. A contemporary account isn't believed to be related to this stuff. There were always rumors that it somehow had to do with the proxy fights and the um, his financial situation and stuff. But I've never seen things later that claimed that that was really true. Um, you know, it was whatever other things. And there's some talk of depression and stuff with him earlier in his life anyway. Um, so it may have had more to do with something like that that we don't know much about. Mm -hmm. Why is this title perfect for? him right the populace of wall street i mean that's what he really focused on with these uh proxy fights and who he was right. and how he took control of these different companies so i actually knew about this proxy fight and robert young before reading dear chairman or any business book actually um because of the thing that's on the cover of the book that you have there which is the hog ad which is a famous ad with the title, A Hog Can Cross the Country Without Changing Trains, But You Can't. And I believe it's in Ogilvy on advertising. It's in lots of advertising books and um, of ad advertisers voting. It's one of the best um, like corporate image ads or public uh, pressure ads, whatever you want to call it. Um, uh, not an ad selling a product, but an ad selling, a, in this case, proxy things or a corporate campaign or whatever. Um, so it got huge responses and... Um, it didn't necessarily help him in the way that we're going to be talking about because uh, we're interested in investing. This is an investing podcast. So we'll see that although he may win some proxy fights and things, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have great outcomes in terms of the investment side of it. But it got huge response, uh, hundreds of editorials written around the country about it and thousands of letters, and it was huge news um, and because of how he did it. Uh, and actually the, the ad agency wanted to resign instead of doing that ad. And later, when he does the proxy fight we're talking about, he doesn't even use an ad agency at all for that reason. He he do, he, he hired one person to work with him to write all the copy and everything. They don't use an ad agency because I think he got fed up with them not wanting to do ads like that one. Yeah, and while the person he was going up against had a team of you know people, uh, ad agencies and lawyers, and you know we're using company funds to do this, and he was using all of his own capital to do this, and it was just him and one other mm -hmm. guy, as you said, yeah. Uh, it was kind of like a David versus Goliath is a, is a good way to think about it. Uh, do you want to explain what Chesapeake and oil railway uh, was and, and, you know, how the chapter starts so, off with that? Well, okay. So the Chesapeake and Ohio railway, I think this part of the story is not important to us and we can, so it, it was, like I said, um, this gives you some idea of how he learned about how to do a proxy fight. And yep. so he kind of um, pioneered those ideas by going directly to the uh, people, um, the shareholders. And there's a lot of this in the book, The Populist of Wall Street, about the SEC responses and stuff in the 1950s. Um, because the SEC wasn't used to the idea that someone other than management would run these things, and so they had a lot of problems with what they would do to have him file material and stuff, 
And so it gets into the complexity of that. Because basically for those outside the United States and stuff, the issue is that the SEC wants to control what information goes out so that people don't put out misleading information and stuff. But in the United States, the federal government obviously can't stop people from communicating ahead of time so that you, you can't, you know, uh, restrict speech ahead of time. You can't say you can't say something. You can only say we'll punish you after you say that thing. So they're in the weird position that they get the information given to them that will go out and then they comment on it, but they don't say yes, they don't clear it. They don't say, yes, this is definitely good and we won't cause you any problems if you go ahead with this, nor do they tell you you can't send this out. Instead, they just comment about what things they want to have changed and everything. And so um, he ended up doing press releases, which then set the precedent that those are filed after you do them, not before with the SEC. And then he also did lots of off-the-cuff stuff. So because that, that the SEC then determined that what it would do is spontaneous things it couldn't control. So it cared about whether there was things that were printed up notes ahead of time and stuff, but that you couldn't do things in interviews and stuff. And a big reason for that is a bunch of newspapers um, got together and fought the SEC on it and stuff. And so the SEC caved on that because the newspaper said, you know, we're going to report on this and we're going to write editorials and stuff. And um, obviously that might affect people's proxy votes, but you don't, you can't control what goes in a newspaper. Right. So it, it was a media thing like you would have basically as they describe in the chapter, it, he ran it like a political campaign, you know, that he ran it like he was running a political campaign, like he was um, looking for votes that way. And that was novel at the time. And although he painted as David versus Goliath in the one we're going to talk about with the New York Central, I believe he spent more money than they did. They both spent a ton. In today's dollars, I don't know, it'd be seven, eight million, something in that neighborhood, probably adjusted for inflation. But they both spent a lot. And um, he spent at least as much as they did, I would bet. Got a lot more free publicity than they did, though, and obviously got more votes. I mean, he was good at, I don't want to say playing the game, but yeah, running it as if he, it was a political campaign, getting attention, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, with things like the, the ad that we said, the hog ad, which is, of course, famous. Um, and also, like we talked about, um, well, we didn't talk about this part. So this is where it's different from Ben Graham, right? So the proxy thing, the proxy things are often quite ugly. And we'll we get into that when we get to like Dan Loeb and all those things and the personal things and nasty things that way, in part maybe to provoke the person to respond and everything. Um, so this is not as nice as the Ben Graham approaching um, the Rockefellers uh, privately. This is much more um, the two having kind of dueling press releases and stuff like that. Um, so some of it was obviously intended to get under the skin of the people on the other side and get them to make statements and stuff that would have them not look as good. Like for instance, one of the things is that they were, did an interview with um, a media thing where both of them were asked the same questions and they both gave responses and then it was printed next to each other and stuff like that. They did not come off looking good. The, the, uh, the president of the company. Um, so, drawing them out into those kinds of conversations is probably part of what helped. Um, mm -hmm. So do you want to talk about New York Central? Do you want to give a background on, on that company from what you know and how well, he gets involved not, with it? Sure. So it's not very important to the story, to be honest. Um, as it turns out, the New York Central is basically insolvent at the time that he's doing this. He doesn't know that. Um, and like I said, it emerged be merged in with another railroad about 10 years later or something after he wins this proxy fight. Uh, 12 years later, I think. And uh, then it would go bankrupt. But it was in terrible shape, as a lot of the railroads were already. Some of that was hidden from the public. Um, and so that, that also may have been part of why the CEO, um, William White, uh, did not do such a great job in the proxy fight. By the end, he sounded um, quite depressed. And he, he actually sounded a lot... He, deflated. Yeah, he, sounded a, he sounded a lot like... Um, who am I thinking of? At... Um, FTX, the woman who was running Alameda. Oh, um, yeah. yeah. So anyway, so, face. Yeah. so she gave a speech to the employees there where she basically said how relieved she was to finally have this, this fraud off of her shoulders and stuff. And um, this wasn't a fraud, but in the last days of the proxy campaign, William White sounds that way. 
in some of the things that he, he says both in, in the Jeff Graham book, but also some things in the that are quoted in the populist of Wall Street, where he says some things that almost sound like he wants to lose in the last days, like that he'd be relieved if they did lose because he's standing up there with some other people and they're, and he doesn't say like in the unlikely event that we would lose or something, but he says, well, if we lose on whatever day. And, and um, that's probably because he knew that it was that bad. Um, you know, and he says, he just wishes that, um, that when Robert Young gets up there, you know, that he'll see what the situation is and understand the difficulty of it and all of that. Um, so, but they didn't say that. And they also, they did fight on the idea that you couldn't pay out high dividends and stuff, and they may have known better on that. So, so as an investment, it did not work out that great. Um, the proxy fight itself drove up the stock price, and then, like I said, by the time of the merger, twelve years later, the stock had gone up a few times more by then. But it would be bankrupt. The entity it was merged into within fourteen, fifteen years, something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this story became um, almost like. Uh sensationalized i guess you could say right like how he mm -hmm. said like you're going up against like the goddamn bankers was his uh the way that he worded it and he really positioned himself that he was uh as it says in the book courting aunt jane right like doing things for them to go up against these goddamn bankers uh if you look at like yeah. the board of new york central i mean it was it was stacked with i mean business luminaries is i think how jeff graham yeah. phrased it uh, you had people that you, know, you had like a Vanderbilt on there. You had JP Morgan on mm -hmm. there. Um, you had somebody from, uh, uh, Mellon national bank and first national bank. I mean, you just had all of these very successful, uh, people on this board. And then you had Robert young who was going up against mm -hmm. them and doing this on behalf of aunt Jane. Right. And one thing that I thought was pretty interesting later on when he, puts forward his slate he actually added um people to the board which during that time frame would have been considered unprecedented right he added um a woman and during that time frame yes. it was probably more unprecedented and he also added somebody that was a retiree from new york central and worker. was a, a, yes. yeah, a worker exactly. and um it yeah. was on like the honor roll at the company um, I don't know mm -hmm. what that is, but I imagine someone in very high regard, uh, you know, what honorable means and, uh, you know, his weight would carry a lot for the workers and, and say a lot to shareholders as well, quite frankly, right. That he was doing this for, you know, the common folk as opposed to the, the suits, uh, in a more modern, mm -hmm. uh, way to put it. Uh, so I thought that was pretty interesting and his approach to doing that was just, I almost feel like he was tormenting uh new york central and and uh what was his name um uh, something white what was his first name william white, william white? yeah william white yeah, yeah I, I think this goes back to one of the ones who i said we don't really need to talk about but one of the early proxy fight things he was involved with a railroad and he had a meeting with a um a major partner a, a major player at um, jp morgan um and he they had like taken the securities public and so they like placed securities for the company and stuff, but they didn't own um, stock in the company really. And he said, you know, so what are your plans and stuff? And we'd like to discuss those with you. And so he said, okay, I'll, you know, I'll discuss them with you. And he realized that what this guy was doing is he was saying, Oh, I want to help you plan out the future because at all the Morgan railroads, you know, we, we work with them to plan out their strategy and stuff over time. Um, so the, it, he got really upset. And I think that's what caused his whole career that way is realizing that someone who owned no stock in the company, who basically was just a wall street firm that had um, sold securities and stuff was thinking that it could have a hand in each of these different railroads that it was associated with um, financing uh, without having an ongoing ownership stake in it and stuff. Um, so I think that really bothered him. And after that, that was his problem with the bankers and yeah. Um, that meeting, I think it was a turning point of his life. Mm -hmm. To put this in context for people. So like one thing that he would do is if the company would issue something publicly about him uh, that they probably thought would make him look bad, he would almost flip it on its head and run an advertisement on their advertisement um, and try to make them look, I guess, silly, right? And try to connect more so with um, the shareholders. Uh, but yeah, so he ran on 
uh, or he campaigned on three themes, which Jeff hits on, um, the need for an ownership board. He had said that the New York Central's uh, banker-dominated board was, you know, obviously long overdue. They had to get people that actually own stock on the board, uh, who own yeah. stock to get on the board and control the board. Um, he hit on the fact that they had poor operating performance um, and that he had a futuristic vision is what he ran on of high speed commuter rail and nonstop transcontinental service uh, compared to what they were uh, currently doing. So he ran on those three things. Right. And they would never do that in a successful way, the passenger service or anything, but the public liked it. And that was what, you know, what we talked about the hog ad and everything. And some of that was pre-tested. What they did is they went out and they um, tested to see what things would resonate most with voters, um, which is a normal thing in political stuff to do. Um, but is not so normal for um, uh, proxy things. In fact, I don't think it's ever been done before. Um, and much of the fight against him, which the you know dear chairman gets into a bit, and we said was complicated, and the populace of Wall Street gets into way more, is that most of the tactics that the companies took against him, um, eventually the New York Central did fight it out in the press and everything, and spend like a million dollars. But um, most of the other ones were attempts through washington and through courts to do various legal things to try to stop him um rather than actually engaging in a um a head-to-head -head talking to or trying to win over ac actual um shareholders and stuff so much uh what when that really happened was the the new york central one that's what makes that one special um so uh, yeah, like you said, and that comparison is something that they do all the time now. He compared the performance of one railroad, which he was involved with, to the performance of um, the New York Central. Um, and that's something that you see now all the time, right? That's every uh, thing will do that where they comp them against peers and show how bad they are and stuff. That's typical of every single um, sort of proxy fight stuff now, I would say. He pioneered a lot of things that are used all the time. Um yeah. Uh, he did hire a, a, pro a professional proxy soliciting firm. He had originally wanted not to do that and to just do everything himself. Um, but that was the one thing that they did pay for outside stuff on. But his main thing was getting lots and lots of press coverage, basically. is figuring out things that would interest newspapers to write about it so you get free press. So the idea was not to create an ad that would actually have to run everywhere, but that people would pick it up as a story and um, do it that way. And like we said, a lot more plain spoken. Um, also, he ran things in other languages. He ran things in Yiddish, for instance, um, to speak directly to shareholders in languages that weren't English. I mean, they ran things in English next to it, too. But um, he did choose a Jew as one of the people to put on the um, board, too. Um, so there was different things that way that was the company was less likely to want to do. Mm -hmm. In fact, when you mentioned the the woman one, um, the when he said that he would have a woman who, by the way, was not just any woman. She was yeah. uh, one of the publishers of Reader's Digest, which probably wasn't an accident. There were 10 million people subscribed to Reader's Digest at the time. So mm -hmm. that should um, bad us. Yeah. Yeah. And he picked a lot of publishers and stuff. Um, but the company said there was no vacancies on the board when they were asked if they would be appointing a woman. So yeah. they didn't match mm -hmm. that one, you know. Um, and also yeah. a good Catholic. <laughs> Someone that was yeah. described as a good Catholic as well. Yeah. Well, he tried to get the um, head of uh, Notre Dame at the time who was interested in doing it, but just felt with his position and stuff, he shouldn't get involved with someone like that. So he recommended someone else, and that's what they ended up going with. Yeah, but that was one of the other groups that he wanted to do. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so he was good at putting together a board that fit within what he was running on, right? They all owned a bunch of stock. It was an ownership. It was a, a, a board that was ran by owners. Um and then he would compare it to the board that was currently at the company, which collectively owned like not even a percent of the stock. I believe they owned absolutely nothing. Yeah, um, and he printed a comparison as one of his ads, a table showing the ownership of each of his board nominees uh, next to a comparison of all of their ownership in the um, company. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, you know they continued to hit at each other, and then you know as you had said, uh, William White. Towards the end, it sounded like it was starting to weigh on him, um, more so the uh, proxy contest. And uh, do you want to talk about 
what actually happened when they tallied up the votes. I thought it was kind of funny. They tallied the uh, votes, and I guess he, uh, Robert Young, he interrupted the meeting to announce the shareholders. Oh. I'm happy to tell you that we have won, um, is what he like basically yelled into the microphone. And by a million shares, because there were 800,000 shares that were in question, which were held in a trust, but the owner was associated with um robert young but he didn't have the right possibly to vote the shares of the trust could choose not to vote the shares to, according to the wishes of its owner as long as it was economic things there were all court cases about this um in fact the company was still in court the very day of the annual meeting trying to get it stopped even though the judge had told them don't come back to court i won't stop the annual meeting they still showed up in court and tried to get them even while the meeting was going on to to enjoin them against and stuff but um yeah, so he sp specifically said not only that they won, but that they won by uh, over a million votes, which would mean that the 800,000 didn't matter. As it turned out, they did win by a little over a million votes, but they yeah. didn't know that for weeks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just thought it was funny that he blurted it out, and then I guess uh, William White took the microphone and said, does he have the authority to say that? And he didn't right. at that time because they were still tallying and counting everything up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but the reason for saying that is if they got a legal decision later and it turned out that it was 795,000 votes, the press would report initially that he won, which would be true. He would win the first day. He knew, I mean, presumably he knew he was going to win by at least some amount, just not that he would win by more than 800,000. And um, then it would sound like the election was stolen from him, right, three weeks later or whatever, when some court case would say that actually the trust could vote that way. Because no one knew how the trust stuff would turn out, if they would actually count the votes, how the votes would be, all of that kind of stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. So uh, the question was how much he would win by. Mm -hmm. um, so he won. And then what? Yes. As you had talked about in the beginning. Right. Well, so then he uh, realized that the company was basically insolvent. And here we can get to, like, here's from the, um, the populist of Wall Street in the Q&A part right before the election, um, Young was asked, you know, about uh, if they could do passenger service through Chicago and things like that. And he said, I'm sure that under new leadership reasons can be made. The New York Central presently operates through cars over four western routes, but with layovers in Chicago and excusably averaging more than five hours. So a pretty simple answer. Mr. White gave this answer, which is quite strange. And this tips you off to the problems that the company was having and stuff. And also maybe why they weren't able to communicate that well. Yes, it is physically possible to provide transcontinental service without a Chicago layover, but many considerations not known to Mr. Young are involved. The demand for such transcontinental passengers through service is not sufficiently apparent to warrant the costs and losses involved. We cannot disclose these now, but they are such that no matter who controls New York Central, they cannot be ignored. So what happened here exactly? Um, one issue is if they had said how bad the situation was, would they have had no hope of ever being elected? And so were they hoping to hold out as long as possible till after the election to say how bad the results were? Probably. That's my guess. Um, it's interesting, though, because you wonder, like, would White have even stayed on? You know, he hadn't been there for long, but knowing what the situation was, if they had barely won the election and then they reported disastrous results... Um, so anyway, they brought in a CEO from uh, another railroad, which actually was sort of an accident, which is kind of interesting. Um, he kind of floated the idea without talking to the guy. Um, and so the newspapers approached him and he said, oh, well, I'd be honored, but, you know, I, I'm not looking for a job. Right. And anyway, he ended up taking the job and stuff. Um, so he, they did actually make improvements, to be honest, to the company. But I don't know that either they or the company would have ever been successful in um, steering it through the next 10 years or whatever so that it wouldn't eventually end up in bankruptcy and stuff. But it did survive. And like I said, it merged. Um, so this is 12 years before the book is written that I mentioned, the the uh, Pivots to Wall Street book, and that's almost 12 years before the merger. Um, so it did have a life of another decade or so, and maybe that was longer because he won the campaign. I don't know. Um, but it does give you an idea that they were both fighting over this prize that wasn't much of anything to have. Now, it's mostly because it was in the bad industry. Um, yeah. Yeah, towards the end of the chapter, they talked about there was a board meeting where they voted to cancel the dividend. And I guess supposedly Robert was 
distant or not himself or just not engaged and mm -hmm. uh people uh thought something was off and i guess there were rumors going around that he was broke or having finance problems um so i guess they assumed maybe that was it and um he says later that week he killed himself with a shotgun in his palm beach mansion word spread that young died penniless bankrupted by his holdings in allegheny and the new york central in fact, Robert Young left behind a vast fortune, including cash, securities, artwork, and property. He had succumbed to the depression he struggled with for most of his life. So, sad outcome. Like I said, I definitely was not expecting that just from reading the the book or the chapter as it was as I was turning the pages. Yeah. So it turned out not to be much of a prize for either of them winning it, and. Um... As we said, um, yeah, I mean, he did commit suicide, but I don't think we have any evidence on which to base that it has anything to do with this. Um, mm -hmm. It may or may not, but and I even think that those recollections of those rumors and stuff are mostly sourced from after they knew that he had committed suicide. So I'm not sure there were market rumors as mm -hmm. the stock was going down in price and stuff, but I don't think even most of those things are reliable. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Any takeaways from Robert Young? I mean, for me, some big takeaways were just how good at campaigning he was, right? Creating this movement almost is what it kind of reminded me of. Uh, he was good at creating the story uh, to the Aunt Janes, as they described in the book, or as he had said, and really going after the bankers, right? And, um, you know, just really pushing forward uh, shoulder shareholder democracy and boards that are actually ran by owners as opposed to people that aren't. And he even had said at one point in the book that like of the four board members that were currently on the New York central board, they, you know, were part of banks or whatever. And they had, I don't know, 50 other companies that they were part of. And he had said like, do you think they're mm -hmm. actually focused on your company? I mean, of course they're not right. How could they be? And you see that a lot today, a lot of uh, professional board sitters that also sit on four or five different boards. It's a pretty cushy mm -hmm. job, right? You get paid 50 or 100 grand to sit on like these larger boards even, and you sit on a couple. I mean, that's pretty sweet, right? You show up for four board meetings in a year, shake some hands, kiss some babies, uh, agree with the majority, and cash your checks. Um, so it was nice to see that he was standing up for shareholders, especially because he had a huge stake in the company. I mean, at one point, I mean, I did inflation yeah. adjust it, and... Um, his slate collectively how much they own i mean it was in today's dollars it would be like considered a substantial stake um looks like it was 578 million worth i mean huge okay. absolutely mm -hmm. huge that was so a really good real skin in the game yeah 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 um so on the first page of the populist of wall street i think they sum up pretty well his approach and how it was different from other people it says um, the, the book is written by someone who uh, basically who um, worked uh, with um, Young. He was basically like his lawyer in some of these proxy fight things, kind of. Um, so anyway, it says Young confounded them by enlarging the field of conflict to include extra legal arenas, relying on the element of surprise he sought constantly to keep the initiative armed with the legal advice that truth is an absolute defense against libel. He deliberately created tumult by pe peppering his charges with sensational detail. In all these confrontations, uh, he enlisted public opinion as an ally. David against Goliath became the theme of his career uh, and controversy the essence of his public personality. And he got a lot of enemies as a result of that, obviously. So that was definitely a problem. Um, yeah that happens from that but the things that we said are true that it was a public campaign and like we said he sought to constantly to keep the initiative and um he had as much fighting with his own lawyers and ad agencies and stuff about what things to do as anyone else to be honest um because of concerns about that um and this became a famous famous uh case uh you know th there's some pictures and stuff in the book of the actual meeting um, and you can see how many people there are. There are hundreds of reporters there. Um, in addition to all the shareholders and stuff that you'd expect. Um, so, uh, it, you know, it became a media sensation that way. Yeah. And so most of the things that we'll read about later in, um, 
Jeff Graham's dear chairman, the later chapters, which will involve proxy stuff. Most all of them will involve proxy stuff. This is like basics of how people campaign now is, mm-hmm. you know, he, he's really more than Ben Graham and stuff. I think that Robert Young is the, um, the, that he's basically the example that, that all of them follow in terms of the kind of basics of what they do, whatever their case is and stuff. They first start from approaching it the way that he would, and then they adjust to their own personalities and stuff from there. But the basics of how they all kind of, um, the, the playbook that they copy is basically the one that he came up with. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I felt like I was reading uh, Sun Tzu, The Art of War, <laughs> kind of from, from some of the stuff that he was doing, you know, just like the element of surprise and the approach that he was taking. Um, I thought it was pretty interesting. Yeah. And when he was involved in a proxy like this, he did meet, ev- they met every day. He and his team met every day at 8 a.m. Um, so, yeah, they responded fast sometimes. In fact, when I was talking about the SEC thing, that's actually the problem the SEC had. They said, um, you know what, this is too much stuff. We can't actually process all this material this quickly. And so that's how they had to make a decision and stuff because they kept releasing things faster than the SEC felt that they could look at them and stuff and what would they do about it. Um, and it also says some other precedents. The 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 thing that the um, New York Central said was the best money they ever spent was they did something illegal, which is they had gotten it. There was an editorial written about them in a business magazine that was positive on their side. And so they asked to be able to reprint it. And of course, the magazine said, no, you can't reprint it. Um, and they said, okay, we're just going to re- reprint it anyway, including the ads and stuff, which is all, almost all newspapers and things say you can't do that. You use it as like an endorsement of them. And um, now this is a big thing with the SEC for people not to do that. But they did it and they said, we'll just pay the fine and stuff. And so it was, I don't know, in today's dollars be $50,000 or something less than that. So he said that was by far the best thing that they did is just ignoring the copyright and going with it. Um, so even they, the successes that they had, the New York central side of it basically was copying the sorts of approaches that he had. I mean, they never would have thought of that unless they had been involved in that fight up to that point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in with the both of us on next week's podcast. When we talk about dear chairman, we are going to hit on chapter three, which is Warren Buffett and American express the great salad oil swindle so super excited to talk about that so make sure you hit that subscribe button wherever you're listening or watching us here today so you could join us um and get yourself a copy of dear chairman so you could flip through it with Mm -hmm. us as well um if you want to read um uh, to prep for next podcast read the chapter and then bring the chapter and listen to it and go over it with uh, Jeff and myself. So I want to thank everybody so much for tuning with us. If you're interested in learning about our money management services, you can reach out to me at Andrew at focuscompounding.com or go to our website, Focus Compounding, and click that Invest With Us tab. That's the best way to get information on that. Um, and uh, yeah, we appreciate all the support. Hit the subscribe button and we will see you in the next podcast. Take care.